Hello, everybody. We're going to get started now. Um, thank you all for coming. I just want to remind people that this is a hybrid grand round. So there are folks um, zooming into this. And so um, it will be uh, a little bit more um, complex as we go back and forth and I try to get answers, uh, questions at the end. Um, Welcome to this uh, Department of Psychiatry, John Romano Clinical Rounds. Today's presentation, Delivering Medical Care to Patients in Psychiatry, Moving from an Interdisciplinary to a Transdisciplinary Care Model, is going to be presented today by the Division of Medicine in Psychiatry. Um, as you can see, here's the panel. Uh, we have Dr. Aspen Ainsworth, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, who is an embedded psychiatrist on our one of our med psych units, Eric Bovida, Assistant Professor of Medicine and Psychiatry. <clears throat> He's an inpatient uh, hospitalist on 19200. Uh, Kevin Brazil is medical director of the MIPS Primary Care Office. He is duly trained in family medicine and psychiatry. Um, Elaine Rigney is um, actually a senior instructor in psychiatry and medicine, and she actually works on both the inpatient and the outpatient uh, sites. Um, Z soon uh, doctor, psychiatry resident, soon to be a colleague, uh, uh, will be presenting um, on um, an aspect that he's been working on, which is the uh, assertive community treatment. Um, and Dr. Marsha Whitting, who's Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Family Medicine. She is also division, Academic Division Chief for the division, and she will be um, giving us um, uh, thoughts about what is transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary and just the kind of work that happens in this unit. Um, just to remind everybody that this is the Romano rounds here are the learning objectives. We actually, none of us have any financial relationships to anything. Um, and there will be CME provided at this uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, you'll have to fill out the uh, evaluation in order to get CME. For those of you on Zoom, if you do not have an evaluation, there should be a link popping up towards the end of the presentation where you can, um, you can use that as the evaluation. <clears throat> so we're going to get started, and I'm going to just let you know that back in about a year ago now, last July, uh, medicine and psychiatry services became its own division and its own academic division. And as such, it has a division clinical chief, which is myself, and an academic chief, which is Dr. Whitting. Our goal really is, and our mission really is to take care of severely mentally ill patients uh, that receive care in our, in our um, healthcare system um, or from uh, community providers that are not part of a healthcare system at large. Um, as you can see from this slide, uh, the medicine and psychiatry services really are made up of a group of very innovative, um, really flexible, nimble, APP, social workers, techs, RNs, KSECs, peers, pharmacists, psychiatrists, and you can see them all listed there. We have three main sites where we deliver care. It's the MIPS Primary Care Office, which is off-site in the Brighton Health Center next to Strong Ties and Strong Recovery. And we have two inpatient medical units, uh, IMIPS or 19200 which is uh, takes care of the medical needs of people with severe mental illness or other mental illnesses that are better managed in a cohesive team approach. Um, and then last year, our G92 unit opened up is Summits, and it stands for Substance Use Medical Management, Infection Treatment and Support. And it's a unit that is a 10 bed unit that um, really provides care, medical care, for the medical sequela of substance use disorders. Um, we will not be presenting on Summit today. 
And that will be a presentation that Dr. Kirk Harris, who's the medical director, will take on later on in the year or in another grand rounds. Today, we're going to concentrate, though, on the primary care um, office, MIPS primary care, um, and um, the, acute, the IMIPS uh, 192 units, both how they collaborate mostly um, and how we are thinking about how to better serve the need of people with substance use disorder and severe mental illness in a more um, transdisciplinary um, module. And I know everybody's question is, what's transdisciplinary, right? Oh, you all know. Well, most of us don't, so we're gonna have Marsha tell us, all right? <laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Talva. Uh, great to see we've got sort of our our IMIPS team right in the center here. So great to have them. Um, and glad to see so many of our former uh, interns who've spent time on our unit as well as in the outpatient settings and um, increasingly on the new summits unit. Um, so I'm gonna start with a slide um, from a New York Times article in 2018 um, that basically just pointed out what we all know, but is really important to keep honing in on and reminding ourselves, I do think that um, so I'm not a psychiatrist, I kind of consider myself part of um, psychiatry now. I think we have a important role to play in reducing these tragic health disparities for patients with severe mental illnesses. When I use that terminology, SMI, um, I'm really um, talking about patients with uh, severe disorders, mood disorders, so bipolar disorder, depression, anxiety that affects functioning, um, schizophrenia. Um, so usually the more of the psychotic disorder type um, of folks. And really, of course, we're talking here about intersectionality, um, you know, with the kind of baseline underlying uh, factor of trauma, probably promoting a lot of this uh, unequal care. Um, but I do want to acknowledge that race and poverty play an enormous role in these disparities as well. Um, but what's really important to keep in mind here is when we talk to medical audiences, we have to point out again and again that patients with severe mental illness are dying 15 to 30 years earlier, not because of suicide or um, primarily driven by psychiatric conditions, but really it's inflammatory conditions, again, pot potentially due to this underlying role of tra trauma um, leading to congestive heart failure, leading to um, diabetes, uh, these sort of metabolic syndrome. And of course, the overlying issues with health disparities um, related to smoking and um, lifestyle changes can also impact things like COPD, cancer. Um, so why do we have these disparities? Kind of talked about them already. I think there's, you know, multiple ways <clears throat> to think about this. It's clearly multifactorial. Um, one of the really important things that I want to bring up and that many people have talked about, um, including Lisa Rosenbaum, who I really recommend you reading if you haven't already. She does, she's a regular contributor to the New England Journal um, Society and Medicine um, series, and she did a three-part series on the increasing, unfortunately, mortality gap among patients with severe mental illness, um, where she talks about our own biases. Um, so the idea of therapeutic pessimism, which is um, this notion in medicine that if you can't, if, if you're you know, going to diagnose something and not do something about it, why go through that process? Um, and there is this pessimism that exists among many of our peers, and perhaps even um, some of us sometimes that, well, this patient is never going to adhere to this medication, so why even diagnose the heart disease, uh, the diabetes, right? Um, and we beg to differ <laughs> that um, just because it can be frustrating and difficult doesn't mean it's not worth doing. It means taking a different approach, right? And so that's really at the heart of everything we do in medicine and psychiatry is aligning with patients, building trust slowly over time, finding creative solutions and different ways of partnering with patients and families um, to try to address their health needs and keeping in mind their priorities as well. Um, you know, arguably the things we should be doing for any patient, right? But it's just so extreme among this patient population that these creative resources are required. Um, there are a lot of other things mentioned here that you can think of, I'm sure, as well. Um, obviously, histories of trauma in the health system, trauma in the community, um, are going to play a role, so mistrust. Uh, and then, as you all know, the medications that we prescribe for psychosis um, can have 
effects themselves that can impact health. Um, so one really kind of simplistic way of thinking of this, what's the problem? We operate in silos, right? Um, at the home of the biopsychosocial social model, we talk about this all the time. There's the biological, the psychiatric, the social services. They all operate in these separated, reinforced silos based on how our health system was created and how our society um, values them, quite frankly. But in addition to those silos, there are some others to keep in mind. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those today. There are system silos that we've reinforced and created ourselves, even within our own division, as we have now um, been trying to kind of try to figure out how to solve that problem. So looking across the hospital to the inpatient setting, and you'll hear some people talking about that today. Um, and so the answer really is to develop a way to eliminate these silos. Um, so integrated care is one way of thinking about this. Some of you may have heard of the, the term reverse integration, which is sometimes utilized to um, differentiate from the integration of mental health into primary care and instead bring primary care into mental health. Um, we don't love that term, to be honest, because what we believe we do is really taking it to the new level, and that's getting at this term transdisciplinary. So I'm going to explain a little bit more about that. So this is just kind of a neat little diagram um, that kind of shows what we mean by silos. So that first disciplinary care is what we kind of traditionally see in medicine, where you have psychiatry over here in the other wing and the rest of medicine on the other side of the hospital, right? Or you have neurology separated from uh, pediatrics, for example, right? But also social services and social work is separated from nursing, uh, the way that we're trained. Increasingly, we are all being trained to think across disciplines in multidisciplinary groups where we all have something in common. And so now on inpatient units and also in primary care, increasingly we have team meetings with social workers and nurses and physicians together where we all have sort of this common um, sort of thematic umbrella where we're thinking about one type of patient or one patient population and we work together, but mostly staying in our own tracks. Okay, you divide off that task, I'll divide off this one, that's in your your, your lane. Then we move to interdisciplinary, and that's really where the fun and exciting creative stuff happens, where you're in a team that's grown over time, and you start to think alike, and you start to solve, you know, problem solve together. Um, you're really developing some integrated knowledge. Hey, you know, these problems keep coming up. Um, I've been talking to the social worker about this, and I thought, you know, from my nursing perspective, maybe I could address something related to housing insecurity when I talk to the patient. So really developing new knowledge, um, and you're drawing from and contributing to these interdisciplines, right? Um, and then finally, what is transdisciplinary? That is the goal, that is the sort of the mountain that we are trying to reach. Um, and I think the most important thing here is that green section in this little figure, which is suggesting that there's conventional knowledge that we may not be tapping into so often in our, you know, kind of hollowed um, halls of academia or ivory tower to go back to what is the patient experience? What are the priorities of stakeholders who are in the community, family members? How do we integrate them into our daily decisions and our discussions, right? Um, and then really thinking about this common goal setting. So that is what we're going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, these are a bunch of pretty pictures, just to reiterate the same sort of things that you saw on the slide that Telva presented. Give me a second to catch up. Um, but basically what you see is that we started out um, with the primary care clinic in 1999. Okay, 1993 was when the primary care clinic, um, many of you have heard the, the, the stories about um, Dr. Boulay setting up shop right outside of Strong Ties and eventually, um, you know, embedding or having a co-located primary care practice next to Strong Ties and Strong Recovery, and that's where we currently exist. Um, and then in 2007, um, due to a range of different things that were happening at the hospital restructuring, finally we got an inpatient medical psychiatry unit. Um, really the focus was going to be on medical care of patients with uh, psychiatric needs, so folks from the R-Wing 292, 392 who might need more medical care but would be better served by folks who could also manage some of their behavioral and psychiatric needs, um, but also other patients who were um, not as well served around the hospital were coming to this unit, started with 10 beds, and then when I arrived, it um, moved to 20 beds in 2010, and then in 2021, we opened up the Summits unit. 
Um, so the first talk, we're going to hear from um, two of our colleagues, um, Dr. Ainsworth and Dr. Babita, who are going to talk about the transdisciplinary nature of inpatient medicine psychiatry. The second talk will focus on transdisciplinary care and also moving trans, um, I think, integration across um, sort of vertical integration is the term that Ben Lee likes to use, going from inpatient to outpatient. There's also a term called comprehensivist care um, that you'll hear a little bit more about perhaps later today, too. And then finally, um, talking about something very innovative that Z has been working on and we are super excited about, which is taking our model of medicine and psychiatry and trying to move out into the community through innovative things like a sort of community treatment. So without further ado, I'll bring up my colleagues. So uh, I'm Eric Bobita. I'm an internist by training, uh, no formal psychiatry training, although I've, I've long had an interest in uh, psychiatry and in patients with uh, severe mental illness. I came here, gosh, about three and a half years ago now, um, and long enough ago that my my first class of interns will be graduating this year. Um, really, uh, with the aim of providing care for that uh, SMI patient population, and it it had been my experience uh, up to this point that um, we're really not caring for them in a way that. Uh, I felt was necessary. So I was very pleased uh, to find that there was a group of people who were trying to do exactly that. Uh, and I came to the, the cradle of the biopsychosocial model, as it were, and, uh, and found a, a laboratory of sorts for, um, for this kind of team-based co-located uh, care. Uh, and it's been it's been really wonderful and humbling and uh, an incredible learning experience uh, I know for me. Um, so, um, so really, yeah, one ninety two hundred inpatient medicine and psychiatry. We have uh, twenty acute uh, medicine beds, um, and it's. It's really, I mean, it's really about the team uh, on 19200. Uh, we have, you know, I have a, an embedded psychiatrist in Dr. Ainsworth, incredible team of, uh, of APPs, of nurses, uh, and full-time, you know, two full-time social workers, psychology interns, um, and just, everyone putting their heads together every day to see how we can provide uh, the best possible care um, for our patients. Um, so this is, we have kind of a timeline that I know uh, Marcia kind of uh, uh, touched on. We're always, I think my takeaway from this slide is we're, we're never, uh, we're never resting. We're always, uh, trying to find ways that we can do this uh, more effectively uh, than we are. So my, from my perspective, I mean, I'm an, I'm an internist and I've hired into the Department of Psychiatry, which, is a, which was a change. And I think we uh, culturally are very grounded in the, the psychiatry culture in terms of the team approach uh, was something that I see in other, other areas in psychiatry and much less so uh, in my realm in medicine. Um, so really, uh, you know, I see, t I see 10 patients a day, which to a hospitalist is a pretty manageable uh, census. However, um, the complexity of, of course, the, the psychiatric complexity, the social complexity um, that we see is, is much, much different. 
So uh, how do we address that? And I think it, I would argue that not only is it desirable uh, to provide this transdisciplinary approach, but it's actually imperative um, if we're going to have any hope of addressing the uh, the health disparities that that uh, that Marcia had had uh, spoken about. So, and I think that uh, in in practice for us is best illustrated by our um, our meeting every day where everyone's sitting around the table, uh, bringing their uh, bringing their perspectives. Um, but in a way, and I think continuity is very important uh, for this as well, continuity among each other, among ourselves as a team, understanding each other very well and how we practice um, where really we are able to uh, create something that I think is, is greater than the sum of the parts. And I, I, I think of, I think of transdisciplinary, the way I conceptualize that is it's, it's kind of like a chemical reaction where we come, we come together and we create, uh, we're, we're fundamentally changed and we create products that are new uh, and different than what we started with. Um, so this is, uh, you know, I think the other, you know, the transdisciplinary you can illustrate with, um, I ask much more pointed consult questions than I think I ever, I ever did uh, when I was getting started um, because I may have an idea of what Aspen is going to say or whatever, you know, whoever the consult psychiatrist may be. Um, so I'm thinking, uh, I'm trying to think how she thinks, and she's trying to think how I think, and we we kind of meet uh, in the middle to meet the patient's needs. So I think with uh, without any further ado, I'll bring uh, Dr. Ainsworth to the podium, who is the the yin to my yang, <laughs> and just. Uh, just a terrific person. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Aspen Ainsworth. I'm a consultation liaison psychiatrist in the department. And the embedded, I have an embedded role on the inpatient medicine and psychiatry service. So let's talk a little bit about the secrets in this sauce that you're hearing about. There are obviously lots of secrets. Um, the biggest one that you've heard over and over is teamwork. And so I guess that's not so much of a secret, um, but teamwork makes the dream work, right? Um, so a lot of aspects of how we're trying to move from multidisciplinary to transdisciplinary have to do with how we function as a team. You heard Dr. Bobita talk about continuity being an important factor. You heard him talk about um, processes, some of the processes that we use. He mentioned our daily team rounds. And I think you've heard about shared values that we're all on the same page about something that we're working together towards. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more about those. You heard Dr. Bobita mention some of the folks in our team. We have actually quite a large inpatient team. This is not the case of a Mary Poppins one man band where one person is very skilled and wearing all the hats, right? Um, that's not what transdisciplinary means. Uh, we have a bunch of really excellent uh, clinicians and healthcare providers who bring expertise and uh, think in a similar way. So you've heard about a bunch of these folks, our medicine APPs, our internal medicine, family medicine, med psych physicians, uh, a crew of nursing staff, two embedded social workers. Every patient is assigned and sees a social worker, embedded part-time psychiatrist. The team collaborates very closely with the inpatient consultation liaison psychiatry service, who has been serving the unit from the very start, uh, psychology interns, and a bunch of trainees.
talking a little bit more about continuity. You, you heard Eric mention continuity. Continuity helps facilitate all these processes that move us towards transdisciplinary. Communication, collaboration, mutual, mutual understanding and trust, um, and working towards shared goals. So starting with individuals, individuals are the building blocks of teams. The folks who tend to be interested in working on this unit and coming uh, to care for these patients have some shared, uh, shared characteristics. So there's continuity of characteristics of uh, team members. Folks who are naturally collaborative, folks who are really passionate about caring for folks with SMI. And I think possibly the most important folks who are able and willing to take off those disciplinary blinders of kind of, I stay in my line, uh, this is what I do, you know, everybody else can just go do their thing, I'm gonna do my thing. So folks who are really willing to take off those blinders. Um, because those blinders are what keep us in siloed care. Moving to interpersonal. When you have a team uh, with continuity, uh, members of the team get to know each other better. And when we know each other better, we're much more likely to communicate and we're much more likely to develop mutual respect. If I know you and I run into you, I'm much more likely to talk to you and listen to you and learn from you. And so having continuity in the team helps foster communication and trust. And those really are pieces that fuel a well-oiled machine and a well-oiled machine with everyone working towards the same vision and the same goals is, is how we move to transdisciplinary as a group. And we have an up team working on specific initiatives altogether. And obviously the biggest goal is providing excellent high quality whole patient care. I've been thinking about this process of shared efficiency <clears throat> for the last couple of years now. And um, there's aspects of the unit and there's workflow processes that promote this idea of shared efficiency, communication, collaboration, and learning from each other. So very concretely, geographic concentration. We have one unit, uh, which is different than a bunch of the other hospital medicine services where they're spread across multiple units. So simply by the fact that everyone's concentrated on one unit, we're more likely to encounter each other. And that's more opportunities to communicate, collaborate, and work together. There is a couple different processes uh, that I'm going to talk about. So starting in early 2020, I started doing proactive chart review screening of all patients who arrive on the, the unit. And at first, the thought was, well, all the patients have severe persistent mental illness because that's a criteria to get to the unit. So what is this going to offer? And to my surprise, actually, when we started doing that, we identified a whole bunch of additional unmet psychiatric needs, um, and started the processes of anticipating needs that might come up during things like transitions of care from inpatient to outpatient. So actually, you know, by doing proactive screening, we might be anticipating a future need that might have to do with attending their primary care visit. Um, the other thing that it does is it helps facilitate shared, shared and efficient communication. So if I've already reviewed the charts of patients and I know the general gist, uh, when I come to uh, pre-round with the team and discuss all the cases, I'm going to come with some understanding of the patient, which makes our communication just much more efficient. And it can be a two-way communication instead of me just showing up and asking the medical team to fill me in on, on everything that's going on with the patient. And, and I might not come with as much to share. You heard Dr. Bobita talk about our daily, um, our daily team meetings where everyone gets together and discusses every single patient. That's an opportunity for us to give really comprehensive input on every patient's treatment plan. 
every patient is getting input from all the members of the team. We're all there able to offer that input and ask questions of each other, learn from each other. And in that way, we can really start to work more harmoniously. Um, each member of the team is not in a, like an individual foot race to get to the end, right? Um, we're all going to get to the end of the treatment care, uh, the um, episode of care. We're all going to get there together. Um, so it's not about individual efficiency where I want to, you know, get my jo job done as fast as possible and you go get your job done as fast as possible. Really, we're going to get to the, the end together. And what can we accomplish in the meantime efficiently so we can accomplish more than what we've accomplished in the past with siloed care and now, um, now working on transdisciplinary care. So really in that way, uh, as it relates to music, this is about working together harmoniously. So that's, that's how I see moving towards transdisciplinary care. And I'm gonna hand it off to Dr. Brazil. Thank you, Dr. Ainsworth. My name is Kevin Brazil. Uh, as Dr. Oliveris mentioned, I'm the um, medical director at the Medicine Psychiatry Primary Care Office, which is on the Brighton campus. Um, I think the, the first thing that came to mind as I was sort of sitting here uh, is, wow, I actually know people in the audience, which I usually don't, which is sort of exciting. Like, oh, I know that guy, I know that woman. Um, but also being in a meeting in, I think it was the early days of COVID, and we didn't know where we were supposed to sit. And we were sometimes on Zoom and we we're learning how to do Zoom. And Eric Bobita said, you know, if, I, if we have to be in a pandemic, these are the people I want to be in a pandemic with. And I'll always remember that, Eric, because it, it has stuck with me and it's true. Uh, this is a good group of people that we work with and I'm fortunate to be part of it. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is what does the outpatient world look like? Uh, because we're very uh, connected to the inpatient world. Um, I have worked on the inpatient unit. I've worked with many of the PAs and the nurse practitioners, and I'm grateful for their help. And I've worked with Dr. Wenink, and I've worked with Dr. Rigney, and Dr. Bobita, and Dr. Ainsworth many times, and of course with Dr. Oliveris. That's kind of where I started my, my journey at the University of Rochester. But the nice thing is having worked with people both inpatient and outpatient, we sort of have a sense of, of how this works and how things don't work. Most of the time, things work pretty well. But for the most part, as uh, Dr. Ainsworth mentioned with her kind of screening of what are these people's needs beyond the fact that we know they have severe mental illness and they're hospitalized for a medical problem. The other thing that I think that she and her team and uh, Dr. Winning's team on the inpatient unit think is, what are we gonna do with this patient when they're discharged? Um, and that's sort of kind of what we learned in residency. Uh, I trained in Cincinnati of first day the person gets here, what are we gonna do with them when they leave? And so, um, the nice thing is we generally have an idea of where we can provide them with good outpatient medical care once they're on the unit. Many of the people who are on the 192 unit and the G92 unit are patients that we see in the outpatient setting, but other times they either don't have good primary care or don't have adequate primary care or don't have primary care at all. And you know we work um, we, we see this sometimes in CPEP as well. And I work in CPEP on Mondays, and I'm trying to work with the team there sometimes to say, hey, this person doesn't have primary care. I wonder if they would be a good fit for for MIPS. Um, and so what we do is we kind of think about that intake from the very beginning um, in the inpatient unit. And then we think about people on the outpatient side of if they need to be hospitalized, we need to explain to them, it's scary to be in the hospital, but we have a very special unit that we send our patients to. And it makes them feel good wraparound care and understanding that, oh, I'm going to see somebody who Dr. Brazil or Dr. Uh, Rigney knows, or maybe I'll actually see Dr. Rigney because she works on the inpatient unit. And I know her from the outpatient unit. There's a lot of trust, as Dr. Winnick started at the beginning, that we need to build with our patients, many of whom have been traumatized, whether it's in their own personal lives or medical trauma is a big deal. And, the, and we're very sort of conscious of that. Uh, so out of the five docs and APPs who work on the outpatient side, two work in the inpatient side pretty regularly. Dr. Diane Morse, who's not here today, but who also works on the inpatient unit, and Dr. Rigney works there regularly. And I've worked there many times in the past and be happy to do it in the future. And it's nice to know everybody on the inpatient unit. On the flip side, the inpatient folks, uh, many APPs and some of the docs have worked at MIPS as well on the outpatient side. So there's this good sort of back and forth. So what do we do at MIPS? Is it just like your regular old primary care clinic? The answer is pretty much yes, but also very different. 
So our patients generally are people who live either independently, and some of them have jobs, or live in single room occupancy rooms, group homes. Um, some of them, some of our, our patients are without shelter. We work closely with the ACT team. We work closely with Strong Ties and uh, Strong Recovery, Strong Ties Young Adult, Schwarzkopf Clinic to try to get people who may not trust outpatient uh, care or may not really know a doctor who they trust or an APP who they trust into the fold so that they're then more comfortable going to strong ties and seeing their psychiatrist or their psychiatric nurse practitioner for help, seeing their therapist, and then maybe coming over to see Dr. Sarah Chang or Dr. Elaine Rigney for regular diabetes care or I get that EKG done that hasn't been able to be done, or let's get that blood work done that we, you know, I'm kind of afraid of needles, but we have nurses that are skilled and well-trained at the MIPS clinic who can put people at ease and um, often get the tests done that are sort of overwhelming for someone to get done, you know, at a regular lab. So the, the slide that you see in front of you really kind of takes a look at all the different sorts of things that we do at the uh, medicine and psychiatry clinic uh, outpatient. It's your typical outpatient clinic with a couple of different nuances. Uh, we have a, a newly embedded endocrinology clinic to deal with a lot of the uh, metabolic conditions that many of our patients cope with, coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, thyroid dysfunction. And uh, Dr. Suzanne Mielek, who's part of the endocrinology department, has been able to integrate with us, and she's there uh, once a week on Tuesdays to help us with those folks. Uh, we have uh, a, a special nurse who works um, very closely with our inpatient team to do what we call transition of care management appointments. And those are appointments that have to happen hopefully within seven to 15 days, 14 days of discharge so that people know what meds was I, what was I supposed to change when I got out of here? Who's my follow-up supposed to be with? Who, how do I get to see that cardiologist that I was supposed to see? Because as we all know, working in the field, people get discharged and the next thing they know, they've got a bunch of paperwork and a bag full of meds and a taxi home and they get home and they're like, what am I supposed to do? That usually does not happen when they are discharged from the IMIPS unit or from G92. There's a whole wraparound system, as we've already talked about, where people leave the unit and they kind of have a good sense of, okay, what's my next step? Uh, appointments have already been made. Cabs are usually set up, particularly with people who don't really have an understanding of how to set up their own cabs and transportation and stuff. So that's kind of an overall sense of what we do. The slide sort of speaks for itself in terms of all the different things that we do, but it's a really unique place and one that I had not seen before, even in my training in, in family medicine and psychiatry, to have a, 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 an inpatient unit, an outpatient unit that's surrounded by the, the, the mental health as well as the physical health is really a, a wonderful sort of situation to have. And so there's been a lot of talk of, well, how do we talk with each other? So every Friday, we have a group meeting. Um, the uh, crew that I work with in the outpatient world on the Brighton campus is in a big boardroom. Um, and then the team that is currently working on the inpatient unit, whether that's Dr. Rigney or Dr. Winnink or Dr. Bobita and their team will zoom in and we'll kind of talk about who's on the unit that we all know, who's on the unit who's going to be discharged this week, who is discharged already, and who have we found that may need help at MIPS. And on the flip side, we'll say, hey, Jim Bob is not doing too well. We just saw him last week. I'm going to see him on Monday, but he may need uh, a place on the on the unit because he's got a terrible wound in his leg and we're trying to manage it outpatient, but I think that he may need to come in. And so we have this nice back and forth uh, each week, which keeps us all sort of integrated and together. So, you know, if there's anybody in the audience who has any interest in sort of the work that we do, feel free to reach out to me or, or any of our panel members to sort of come and visit schedule time to come and work with us. We'd be happy to have you join us because we're very uh, uh, interested in sort of spreading the word on what we do. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Elaine Rigney now, and she's going to talk a little bit further about the work that we do. So hi, my name's Elaine. And like was said, I work in both the in and outpatient unit on 192, and I'm a primary care doctor in the MIPS clinic. And something that I'm very passionate about is how to keep our patients safe and well cared for in the community. And the one way we've been doing is by measuring our readmission rate. Because if a patient's readmitted to the hospital, somewhere along the line, something went wrong. Either they were too sick, it was too hard for them to follow up with certain care, or there might have been something else that we missed. So how do we stop this readmission loop? And, you know, at face value, sometimes it feels me as a hospitalist, my priorities might seem a little different than as an outpatient doctor. And that in itself is siloed. We're in separate spaces. In the hospital, you're working on stabilization and discharge, whereas outside the hospital, you're more focused on continuity. 
but ultimately we all have the same goal of helping our patients succeed in the community. So I wanted to find ways to kind of integrate us a little bit more. And, you know, focusing on our readmission rate, we track it monthly and it could be as low as zero to 10% and as high as 40% for the patients within our MIPS clinic. And this can be from a variety of reasons. We know these patients are high risk. They might not have the same support or resources in the community. And they also have a lot of both chronic medical and um, mental illness. And then sometimes the treatment for your um, mental illness might predispose you to metabolic syndrome or diabetes or other things that's going to worsen your chronic medical illness. Um, but something that I didn't think about until I started working here was that you have patients who might have been engaged in care for decades with their outpatient supports. When they become admitted, it's a whole new team that takes over. It's a new environment, and that trust building might not be there. Um, so how can we increase the communication on both sides to help our patients? Um, so this is a graph that kind of shows what we've already been discussing, how we have a lot of um, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary communication on the inpatient side, as well as outpatient in MIPS. And I wanted to find a way to really get that uh, arrow in between. How do we all talk to each other and be included on the same page? Um, so what I wanted to focus on was kind of closing this communication gap. When I first started working, I was probably calling, when I was on the inpatient side, calling the MIPS nurses at least weekly about patients who I might not have known, being like, you know, this guy, he's not talking to me at all. Is that normal? And they'd say, oh, no, that's actually very different for him. But, you know, his girlfriend broke up with him. She managed all his meds. So I don't think he's taking them anymore. I learned a lot of valuable information. So I wanted to know how can I share this to make sure all other providers have access to that, too. So some of the things that already existed was we have weekly didactics that both the uh, uh, MIPS and 192 will join, and that might be on an educational topic. But more recently, we've been having conferences about our patients who were admitted and what happened. Um, we talked about the shared staff in both settings. And one other way is our um, MIPS nurses, actually, a lot of them were moonlighting when there were staffing shortages on the inpatient side this year. And now anyone who's newly hired will shadow in both settings. Um, but something we developed more was how do we use our EMR to communicate? So when patients are now admitted to the unit, we'll make sure the nursing as well as providers are aware. So that way we can have an in-basket communication rather than, you know, us getting the discharge summary when the patient's already left the hospital. And this can also help everyone be informed in real time. You know, the in-basket, it's very well used in the outpatient setting, not quite as much in inpatient. We tend to use the direct chat more, which we also use as well when we want an answer right away. And then something that we initiated over the past, I think about six months ago, was how do we basically get all on the same page in real time and have some face-to-face -face communication. So like Dr. Brazil already mentioned, we have our weekly outpatient MIPS meetings, and now we've invited the inpatient side to those. And something that's unique about this, it's not just the providers, the attending, talking to the primary care doctor, but we try to include everyone involved. So our outpatient meetings will have our nursing, our front desk staff, our social worker, our community health workers. And on inpatient, it could be any provider, whether it's the attending, trainees, APPs, our care coordinator, pharmacists, social workers. And then we can really all talk. Because I think if you really want to know what's going on with the patient, you need to be talking to your front desk staff and your nursing. Because they're gonna be in tune to things happening far before that patient makes it to the hospital or to a provider visit. They're the ones who are taking the calls. They're the ones who see them in the waiting room when maybe they're waiting for another appointment, getting a blood draw, getting an injection. Um, so it's really important to have that transdisciplinary communication for our patients. And this here, it just shows a little bit of our data on our readmission rate. So the blue is 192. This is for all MIPS patients who've been readmitted to the hospital. And then the orange is the hospital medicine unit. So as you can see, you know, we still have ways to go. Our readmission rate is certainly not zero and it varies on the month. And that can also be based on, you know, the small sample size of patients that might've been admitted that month. But we do feel like we're doing something right with our communication because Compared to other places in the hospital, our readmission rate is almost always lower. Thank you. And now I'm going to have Z come up. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Z, and I'm a psychiatry resident here, and I've had the great 
privilege of working with all the attendings here on the MIPS team. So you've heard today about um, how we integrate medical care in a transdisciplinary way in primary care and inpatient settings, but what about beyond the walls of our clinics and hospitals? So assertive community treatment or ACT is an evidence-based care model designed specifically for patients with severe mental illness and the highest needs. So these are patients who have repeat mercy room visits, multiple psychiatric hospitalizations, um, about two thirds are experiencing homelessness at that time of enrollment and about 50% have criminal justice involvement. And so ACT is really a life-saving care model for uh, our most vulnerable patients. And the whole goal is to help patients thrive and flourish in our community. So we help patients stabilize their mental illness, uh, their addiction, um, and help them become more independent in the community by providing housing, supported employment, uh, and psychosocial rehabilitation. Now, in contrast to the standard case manager, who often acts as a quarterback, referring patients out to specialists, for ACT, it's actually a team of specialists that all go to the patient. So as one of our ACT psychiatrists, uh, Dr. Steve Lamberti likes to say, it's like house calls, but on steroids. So the team includes a psychiatrist, multiple nurses, a social worker, a therapist, a housing and vocational specialists uh, who all go to the patients uh, where they are in the community. Now, a critical missing piece, of course, is the primary care doctor. So um, in this team that goes and meets patients in the community, we don't yet have a primary care doctor on that team. But the good news- It doesn't have to be a doctor, right? <laughs> right, right, primary care doctor, yep. Um, and so, uh, the good news, though, is that um, ACT is Medicaid reimbursed in over 40 states, so it's a great vehicle to have integrated medical care for our most vulnerable patients. So what I've done here is I've, I've plotted the number of ED visits um, the year before and the year after ACT enrollment, and this is for the two ACT teams that we have here at U, U of R. Uh, and this is over the past 10 years. And what you can see here is that ACT is effective in reducing the number of ED visits, um, but it's actually even more effective at reducing uh, psychiatric hospitalizations. And so what you see here is that the number of psychiatric hospitalizations actually increased right before ACT enrollment. And that's because a second psychiatric hospitalization in the, in the last year is often an admission criteria. Um, but after ACT enrollment, uh, you can see that the psychiatric hospitalization rates plummet. But unfortunately, ACT does not reduce the total number of medical hospitalizations at the population level. And so why is this, right? Because ACT, ACT teams see their patients at least six times a month. And so surely, you know, if any medical needs uh, come up, we should be able to catch it. Um, and so if we actually zoom in to the individual patient level, what we find is that, you know, for the majority of patients, if they had a medical hospitalization the year before ACT enrollment, um, actually the majority don't get another medical hospitalization the year after uh, ACT enrollment. So only about 25% have medical hospitalizations the year before and after. So what does this tell us? Well, the main challenge is that medical hospitalizations are typically rare events. Um, and so we heard on the MIPS panel, 10%, maybe 40%. Um, and so the challenge really is um, a bit like a game of whack-a-mole, right? As soon as we stabilize one patient medically, um, it's very hard to predict who will be medically hospitalized next. And so this really highlights the need to have deep integration with outpatient primary care for proactive uh, medical management. But if we look longitudinally, so this is over 10 years, um, medical hospitalization rates are actually quite high. So about half of ACT patients will get medically hospitalized and uh, those who do have about three hospitalizations. And if you look at why patients are medically hospitalized, Actually, the most common preventable medical hospitalizations uh, for diabetes, asthma, COPD, and heart failure are actually the same as the adult general population. 
So to illustrate how challenging it is to support a medically complex um, ACT patient, I'd love to uh, share a patient vignette and also just really showcase how medical integration can be life-saving. So the patient is a 45-year-old male with schizophrenia and severe cocaine use disorder. He has diabetes with multiple complications and also housing instability. And so um, at the beginning of the year, actually, Dr. Uh, Olivares, his uh, MIPS outpatient provider, uh, actually changed his uh, daily insulin regimen uh, into a longer acting insulin called Traceba. And he was also prescribed a injectable diabetes medication called Trulicity. Now, this might start to sound familiar because as psychiatrists, right, we routinely offer long-acting injectable antipsychotics for patients with poor medication adherence. And so this is simply uh, the medical equivalent for diabetes. And so uh, unfortunately, though, um, the patient did not take these medications. And as you can see here, um, he still had a series of six medical hospitalizations for diabetes complications. And this was in the setting of crack cocaine use. Um, and so the ACT team was constantly trying to find this patient. Um, and when we did, uh, he was not interested in chemical dependency treatment. Um, but eventually we did engage him. And what we ended up doing was actually bringing him to the MIPS clinic, outpatient clinic every week to receive his long acting insulin and also his injectable uh, diabetes medication. And that's actually when the um, string of hospitalizations stopped. And we were very lucky to have uh, Lisa Newell, who actually trained as a medical nurse before joining the ACT team. And you know, it's through her heroic efforts that made sure that this patient got all of his diabetic wound dressings changed, his insulin, um, and also all of his other medical needs met as well. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, this is really reactive medicine, right? So what can we do preventatively? Well, um, psychosocial rehabilitation is actually a key component of ACT. Um, and so we teach patients how to shop for healthy food. And uh, you can see here that we've taken a harm reduction approach uh, when we buy food. So uh, we do include salty buffalo wings, but we also introduce healthier uh, grilled chicken breast. Um, and instead of full sugar soda, we uh, bought Coke Zero. Um, and so it's things like this that, uh, you know, is really a comprehensive uh, kind of support, holistic care for, for our patients. And there's also this really wonderful free gym called Rock Recovery. And all the staff there are on their own recovery journeys. And so this is so much more than a gym. It's really a recovery community. And so when patients go there, they have supports, but really uh, they also have a sense of belonging. Now, these are very intensive services. And so how are we going to pay for this medically integrated biopsychosocial care? Well, if we look at patients with schizophrenia, even patients who are repeatedly psychiatrically hospitalized, um, that's um, the, the dominant cost is actually coming from, from medical. Um, and that's shown here in blue and green. Uh, and, and so in Medicaid patients, which is where most of our patients are, 70% of healthcare costs are medical. And this dominant cost in medical is, is true also in Medicare patients, as well as, well as patients who are on commercial or uh, health um, employer-based health plans. And so it's actually very feasible to fund uh, medical integration into ACT because uh, preventing a few uh, medical hospitalizations will pay for primary care integration uh, for all 70 patients on the ACT team. And we wouldn't need to boil the ocean if we just focused on the most common preventable medical hospitalizations for diabetes, asthma, COPD, and heart failure, we would capture the majority of these savings. Um, and just like we have uh, long-acting injectable antipsychotics, there are long-acting insulins, and for asthma COPD, there are long-acting inhaled medications. So um, there's also potential to actually fund housing, uh, but that's a totally separate discussion. So I'll stop here, and i um, happy to say more during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, and then uh, we have about five minutes left. If anybody has any questions for the panelists, um, just stand up and ask away or raise your hand if you're obedient and I'll call on you. No questions? Well, thank you very much. Oh, there's one there. Okay, I can't see. Uh, should all of the people we treat from SMI and substance use disorder be primary based in MIPS? Yes. <laughs> we think we do the best job at taking care of these people. And we've been trying for a long time to define ourselves as people that uh, were folks that specialize in people with severe mental illness. We keep having ourselves redefined constantly by others, but we really want to take care of people with severe mental illness. That's really our passion. That's really our skill set. And that's really what we want to do. Yes. So I think Dr. Um, Whitting um, put it nicely. It's mostly people with psychotic illnesses. There's a couple of different definitions, but mostly it's people with a psychotic illness such as schizoaffective disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder with psychotic features. There's major depressive disorder, recurrent with psychotic features. All those fall into the realm of people that normally can function in an everyday world like you and I might. So it's a little bit more than somebody that has depression, is treated on Lexapro, but can still work 40 hours a day, right? So these are people that have a lot of social determinants of health that really um, make it so that they're not, um, they can't function the same way as others do. This is wonderful. Can you share the slides so that we can? Oh, sorry. There you go. Take a picture. <laughs> All right, thank you for everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just wondering if there was any work being done to try and address more of the out of county needs for some of our patients as well. So we have thought about that and we are willing to do some of that at MIPS primary care. Um, some of what gets in the way, and I don't know if it's still um, an, a barrier, but it had been Medicaid funding across county is often um, the, the barrier. Not to mention transportation too, right? Because a lot of these folks don't have cars or transportation, but we certainly have taken care of people across counties. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Yeah. No, that was it. Oh, was that for me? <laughs> I didn't know.